And turn your Bibles this morning to James chapter 1. We'll begin with verse 22 today. Now, James is, in essence, introducing a new section in which he exhorts believers to receive the implanted word of truth that is able to restore one's soul. And as we shared a couple of weeks ago, keeping the context of James' comments in mind concerning the essential of asking God for wisdom in everything, especially when you're going through times of trial and temptation, that he gives wisdom if we ask for it, he gives it liberally, without finding fault, without any partiality. If we'll ask in faith, not doubt, then he'll give us a very generous portion of understanding about what to do during those difficult times. So he gives wise counsel, and we receive that through the Holy Spirit as well as through the scripture uh, that speaks God's truth into our hearts. This is what James writes next in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Uh, one of my favorite pastors and teachers over the years has been a guy named Chuck Swindoll, and, and he made this comment. He said, in colleges, in many classes, you have what they call auditors. Any of you ever audited a class in college? Uh, that's where you, you pay money, but you don't get any credit for it. I guess most of you guys want a credit for your class. But they're called auditors, and they, they are merely hearers of the instruction, and they sign up for the class, and then they sit through the lectures. But beyond that, everything is optional. There are no papers to write. There are no tests to take. They're, they're merely hearers of the instructions, but not doers. Uh, and to get credit, you've got to be a doer. James tells us one cannot truly live the Christian life by just hearing the word of truth or being an auditor. It is essential that the wisdom from God is acted upon, and he says that those who are hearers only are pretty much fooling themselves into thinking that they are true to their faith. Verse 23 continues, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Now, back in those days, mirrors were not made of glass like they are today. Uh, they were made of polished metal, usually brass or bronze, or if you had a lot of money, you might have a mirror that's made of silver or gold. And so a wealthy person might be able to have something like that. But because of the imperfection of the reflection that's given, people simply did not use mirrors very much. Uh, and as I get older, once I do the little shave thing, you know, I don't want to see myself anymore because I don't like everything I see there. You know, but uh, uh, they, they didn't use mirrors that much. But if you really wanted to see clearly, what you had to do was find the brightest light and get it turned on to that metal mirror. And then you had to just really look at it very closely and turn it at different angles. You'd make sure you could see what was going on there. And so to get at least a somewhat of an accurate reflection uh, of yourself. It took a lot of time and effort to do that. Now, there's one mirror in our house that I really, really do like, uh, and it takes about 20 pounds off. When I look at that, I'm thinking, have I lost weight? You know, you know, it's, it, it's something, you know, it's, not, it's like I look like a new man this morning, <laughs> you know. And so I like that mirror, but there's this other mirror I don't like as much. But it's more, it's, it gives you a clear image. <laughs> and the, the thing is, it tells the truth. And that's what I don't like always about that particular mirror. So uh, uh, you get the picture. Uh, that is the way the word and the wisdom of God is. It tells the truth and it clearly points out what we need to be doing differently in order to improve our lives and so uh, and facilitate the healing or the restoring of our souls. So if we never face the truth about ourselves, you know, revealed in the Word of God, revealed by the wisdom of God, by the Holy Spirit within us, then we're not going to change. Uh, we're not going to do the things that will improve our lives and our walk with God. So the problem is that a lot of times we may casually look into the mirror of God's Word and His wisdom and catch a glimpse of truth contrasted with what we're doing. And, and we say, oh, no, you know, that's too painful. And so we walk away from that. We don't remember what we have just seen. 
And so we kind of avoid that subject of what we've just seen or those issues that were revealed about us that we know need to change. The original word translated here in this uh, particular verse describes someone who passively sits in an audience uh, and watches a performance on a stage. Like with auditors of college courses, there is no accountability to it. Uh, so the next thing that James explains is how to know if we are not a forgetful hearer, but rather a doer. So this is verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So the mirror about which James is writing is what? It is the word of truth. That's what we look into. And so it's the perfect, he says, it's a perfect law of liberty. That's what the mirror is. How does that reflection come to us and show uh, the blemishes or the things that could change about how we conduct our lives, especially in relationship to others? Now, the perfect law of liberty refers to the summation of the law and prophets of God, which is to love God with one's whole being and to love one's neighbor as him or herself. And so that's the perfect law of liberty. Uh, so the, the Old Testament includes the commandment, and Jesus repeated it as the greatest commandment when he was asked by a lawyer one day, what is the greatest commandment? That guy was kind of trying to trip Jesus up, but he said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's the greatest commandment. Now, here's what the Old Testament says about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. It means not cheating or robbing your neighbor. It means paying your neighbor for services uh, rendered as soon as possible. It meant not giving out a bad report about your neighbors and especially not being a tail bearer. It meant not speaking against your neighbor. It meant not being vindictive nor bearing a grudge against them. In fact, Leviticus 19.18 really spells that out. It says this, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love the Lord your God, or you shall, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so this is a command that's given, not to hold, be vindictive and not to hold a grudge against your neighbor. And that's pretty challenging to us sometimes, isn't it? Uh, earlier, James had commented that the anger of men does not achieve the righteousness of God. And sustained anger has the opposite effect uh, than what receiving the implanted word of truth does in a person's soul. Where God's wise counsel will give us direction and guide us into the restoring of our souls, what does sustained anger do to us? It damages our souls. It drags us down, and it uh, fragments our souls, and it creates, you know, a lot of angst within us. Uh, and so, you know what happens in a person's soul when they've sustained anger there? Uh, they begin to see the whole world through that filter of anger. And so pretty soon, you know, they're, they're getting angry about everything. And they're just kind of jumping on people. You know, they get in arguments constantly, and and they get critical of others and all those kinds of things. And so it does damage to a person's soul. The Old Testament law of liberty meant to do no harm in word or in deed. So to look intently at the law of liberty uh, should result in choosing to do no harm even to those who, who have stirred up anger in us due to some kind of perceived offense. The casual listener Here's the teaching on love, this, this law of love. He hears that teaching and goes, yay, we all believe in love. No, it's what makes the world go around, right? You know, and, and so this teaching on love, and they, they listen to that, but then they don't act it out. They don't walk in that. They don't do the, you know, you remember that verse uh, 25? He says, he says uh, uh, a doer of the work. Did you know love is work? It takes work to really love people the way we have been given the opportunity to do so. It's that love motivation, but then to fulfill that, we have to take action of some kind. We have to become a doer of the perfect law of liberty. So to look intently at the law of liberty should result in doing the work of choosing to do no harm, instead to do good, uh, and to even uh, the most work perhaps in a case like this is the work of forgiving. You know, that's work. I can tell you that. 
and I have to do a little work on that just about every week <laughs> concerning something. When a person listens intently to godly wisdom and is a doer of the work, it asks for the blessing received in, in, in twofold, that, that, that wisdom that is asked for. The blessing is received in a twofold way. The soul is restored, and the door is open for relationships to be healed or to remain healthy, and then the righteousness of God begins to be revealed in that person who is choosing to do that. What is the work that needs to be done? It is the work of love. And this kind of love is not a feeling. We make a mistake when we say, well, I, I, I'll do it when I feel like it. Because the love that's talked about here is not a feeling kind of love. It's a doing kind of love. It's a choosing kind of love. And so this kind of love is the choice to do what is beneficial for not just ourselves, but all of those around us. And so when we include that, that we have the liberty, the law of liberty is to do what is good and righteous and, uh, you know, kind of as a what's best for everyone kind of thing. The liberty that we've been called to, this liberty of love, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says, he said, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Not all things are beneficial. And so even though we're able to do something, we can, you know, we can do something to hurt our neighbor if we want to. And there's no, you know, uh, as long as it's not a crime that's being done or something like that, or, uh, but, but it's not beneficial in any way. It's not beneficial to that person. It's not beneficial to us. So the law of liberty means to do what is good and beneficial for ourselves and those around us. It's like an orchestra. When an orchestra is playing, if one person in the orchestra decides they're going to play something different from everybody else, what's it going to do to the sound? You know, And that word symphony actually is used there in that passage, uh, the word for beneficial there has to do with the symphonic idea, what's beneficial for ourselves and those around us. So that's the work of love. We ask those questions. Are you he hearing this? You know, we ask those questions. Is what I'm about to say, is what I'm about to do going to fit? Is it going to orchestrate something good here? Or is it going to be a sour sound? Is it going to be a, a tone that's given that that is hard to hear, you know, and is it going to mess up the song that's being played? Uh, so there you go, doing the work of love. And so the one who does this, James says, will be rewarded with a blessed life. If wisdom is given to a couple of, for instance, in experiencing marriage stress, and so say they go to a counselor or they just kind of begin to, they hear a teaching on marriage or something going on that says, you know, if you'll do these things, uh, your marriage will get healthy. If you make the choice unselfishly to get rid of the anger you have with one another and you make the choice to love one another and do the work of love in the marriage, then your marriage is going to get healthy. But if that couple, either one of them says, that's too hard. You know, I'm not willing to do that much work on the marriage. Well, then that marriage is going to get into a rut, and the rut gets deeper to the point of maybe even become a gra becoming a grave and, and the death of the marriage. The next few verses introduce three issues that James, the proverbial sage of the New Testament, addresses as intensely important to the Christian community of believers. In verse 26, he writes this, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Now, the word translated religion here refers to the corporate convictions and worship of a well-defined community uh, and organization. And so that would include the Jews. It would include, include Christianity and other religions as well. That, you know, each of those religions has a set value structure, a set, con set of convictions or set of doctrinal truths or all of those things that you're expected to adhere to if you're going to be a part of that religion, right? And so with every religion, there are characteristics that are expected of those who are devoted to it. Now, uh, for instance, in that day, there were other religions besides Judaism and Christianity that were polytheistic. They believed and worshiped many gods. But the Christianity and Judaism believed in the worship of one true God, the Creator God. And so that was something that, that clearly defined uh, those two religions. Now, 
James tells us that one of the more important defining characteristics of the followers of Jesus Christ, according to the law of liberty, is to love one, one's neighbor. It's the choice to bridle one's tongue. So if you're going to be a member of the Jesus people, you know, the, the religion of Christianity, the expected thing is that you're going to be able to make the choice, with God's help, of course, of bridling your tongue. Now, one needs to conscientiously govern what is spoken to others. James says that if a person cannot do this, then their religious piety and even mystical experiences that they say came from God, they had this spiritual experience, that those things are useless then if a person does not choose to bridle their tongue. And so it has been estimated that the average person will speak 18,000 words a day. In a year's time, that would be 66 800-page books in one year. About one-fifth of a person's life is spent talking. So there is a lot to bridle. If the word of God is securely planted in a person's heart, then their words should reflect what? The perfect law of love, of liberty. Liberty to love. The spirit of Christ constrains us like a bridle constrains a horse and guides a horse. The love of Christ within us moves us to measure the content of our speech and the manner with which we speak. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A person may act very religious and pious, but if their speech is not measured according to the perfect law of liberty, then people will see that person as a hypocrite. Okay? That's not me doing that. It's James, okay? You blame him for it. I do agree with it. A long time ago, I was asked by somebody why I did not ask a certain person to teach. Well, the problem was that this person was very angry most of the time, very critical, did not bridle their tongue, and often speaking negatively about other people and to other people. And I just could not afford to let them teach without risking harm to others. They had heard the word of truth, this person had. They had lots and lots of knowledge, but did not live and speak according to the love of Christ. Now, I didn't tell the person who asked me that question. I didn't go, I didn't go down that person's fault and say, well, you know, they're angry and they're, you know, they... They, they're critical and all these. I didn't do that. I'm not going to do that to them, what they were doing to others. You know, this other person's doing to others. But we have to understand that bridling the tongue is an important thing. And later on in James, he even says, let not many of you be teachers because teachers will be held under stricter judgment. And one of those judgments is that a teacher needs to be able to control his or her tongue. Proverbs 11.9 says, The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the righteous will be delivered. Alan Redpath, who wrote something in the Passion for Preaching that is really neat, I want to share it with you. It, he said, I once formed a mutual encouragement fellowship at a time of stress in one of my pastorates. The members subscribed to a simple formula applied before speaking of any person or subject that was perhaps controversial. T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? If what I'm about to say does not pass those tests, I will keep my mouth shut. And it worked. So think about that. You know what that spell, right? <laughs> I wondered if you were listening, you know. Think! <laughs> uh, true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, kind. James was likely reflecting back here on what he had written earlier where he said, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. 
So one person said, speak when you're angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. You know, how true that is. Uh, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, the nature of God is others-centered. Uh, and he has another centered heart always and especially for those who are hurting everybody hurts sometimes and perhaps there's a secondary hurt for far too many that would be to hurt and realize that no one is there really to feel the pain of that difficulty or that hurt that you're going through uh, how many of us you don't have to raise your hand but how many of us have gone through a painful time and just felt all alone in that you know, but there's one place where people are not alone in this world, uh, for sure, and that is in an intensive care waiting room. Why are they not alone? Because everybody there shares the same thing, a hurt, a pain, a sorrow, a wonder, what's going to happen next to their loved one. One pastor wrote this. He said, I have spent long hours in the intensive care waiting room, watching with anguished people, listening to urgent questions. Will my husband make it? Will my child walk again? How do you live without your companion of 30 years? The intensive care waiting room is different from any other place in the world. And the people who wait are different. They can't do enough for each other. No one is rude. The distinctions of race and class melt away. A person is a father first, a black man second. The garbage man loves his wife as much as the college professor loves his. And everyone understands this. Each person pulls for everyone else. In the intensive care waiting room, the world changes. Vanity and pretense vanish. The universe is focused on the doctor's next report. If only it will show improvement. Everyone knows that loving someone else is what life is all about. Long before we're in the intensive care waiting room, maybe we can learn to also live our lives in that way. Follow the same guide. As if when we gather here, for instance, this whole gathering here is an intensive care waiting room. You know, because I want you to know this, every single person here has a story to tell, a story of concern, a story of hurt, a story of concern about some loved one who's going through difficult times. And so our hearts are moved when we recognize that we're all in that same boat together. You know, we are, in a sense, an intensive care waiting room. James says that religion is at its purest when God leads us to minister to orphans and widows in their trouble. And this is his second example of authentic religion. The first is the ability or the choice to bridle one's tongue. Now, why is this religion at its purest to minister to orphans and widows? It is because widows and orphans in need have nothing to give back. Our choice to care for them, to minister to their needs, is not based upon any idea that they're going to give back to us that we're going to get a, a payback for what we're doing. It is perfect love being given. It is an unconditional act of love. The choice to love the socially needy of our world is undefiled religion in its purest mo motivation is to do good. Perhaps the fellowship of Jesus' followers was in its purest in those early days right after the Holy Spirit had come upon them and all thousands of people had come to Christ and confessed Him as Lord, when the new believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, their lives were marked by love for one another and by concern for those in need. Acts chapter 2, verse 44 says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now we know in Acts chapter 6 that there were many hundreds perhaps of European widows who had come for the Passover and who had confessed Jesus as Lord. And there was a problem in that there was no 
really adequate support system for these widows there in Jerusalem because they did not have family with them. They did not have uh, their normal support system from wherever they came from. And so what happened there was that the apostles got together and they appointed seven men full of the Holy Spirit, a good reputation, and the skill to administrate, and they uh, organized the support system for those European widows because they were very important to the Christian community. In the Olivet Discourse, in Matthew 25, Jesus, Jesus even noted that true righteousness will be judged by those kinds of things. It, be, it, it will be manifested and judged and known through ministry to the sick, the hungry, the poor, the displaced, and those in prison. That's how Jesus said he would know that somebody's righteousness was authentic when they're doing those things. Those who claim to be religious but ignore those in need are exhibiting true devotion to God, uh, God and bring dishonor to him or they're not exhibiting true devotion to God and bring dishonor to his name. They talk religion, but fail to walk it out according to the law of love. I so admire the work that is done in the name of Christ by ministries such as the Salvation Army, Room in the Inn, National Rescue Mission, Gillisville Help Center, the Samaritan Center in Hendersonville, Fresh Start Resources, and many, many others in, the, in our area, Nashville is full of Christian organizations who are caring for the poor, who are doing authentic religion in the name of Christ. Listen, it would be devastating if there were no faith-based charitable organizations doing this work of pure and undefiled religion in the world. You know, we need to understand that this is a calling from God for all believers. Uh, and, you know, those, who, you know, I, I have to little take a poke here a little bit, you know, at those who are so judgmental and critical and, uh, of Christianity, they don't really have any clue what the world would be like without true, authentic Christians in it. Because there were, literally would be no charitable organizations doing all those kinds of things in our community. But because Jesus lives in the hearts of those who follow him, that's what's happened. And so, authentic religion is to minister to those in need. The third characteristic of a pure and undefiled Christian community is to remain unspotted by the world. The word translated world here, world here represents philosophies and cultural norms uh, that are hostile to the way of Christ and God's word. So we need to keep up our guard today because we can so easily be seduced into these things and they will displace faith and service to Christ. The word unspotted was used to describe a sacrifice without blemish, so sacrifice of worship without blemish. And this reminds us how the Apostle Paul exhorted uh, the Roman Christians in Romans chapter 12 that we be a living sacrifice unto God so that we can prove that reasonable service Unto the, of worship unto the Lord. Then right after that, he said these words. He said that we are not, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is important to remember that Jesus Christ and God's word are the standard that we measure ourselves by, not the philosophies of this world, not the norms of this world, there are many voices out there that are contrary to the teaching and the nature of Jesus. We should always ask how they measure up to him. The next thing James does here is he gives instruction about what happens when Christian believers gather for worship and fellowship. And this is in James chapter 2. Look at verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? 
So first of all, James clearly identifies who the recipients of his letter are. Who are they? His Christian brothers who hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's writing, in all likelihood, to Jewish believers in Christ. The word partiality means discrimination. The foundational conviction is that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, does not discriminate against anyone. Jesus did not discriminate during his ministry on this earth. He treated everyone without partiality, whether Jew or Gentile, Samaritan, whether rich or poor, male or female. He also taught his disciples to do the same. When Christians assemble, there should be no discrimination for ethnicity, race, political affiliation, social class, or economic status. None of those things should matter to us. They're Christian brothers and sisters that we're gathering with. David Guzik points out that during the time that James wrote this epistle, there was intense class and social discrimination in the world. And the word assembly is literally taken from the word synagogue here, emphasizing that James is primarily writing to a Jewish audience, those who have become believers. At that time, Jews were especially known for class distinctions and certainly prejudicial toward Gentiles. But the focus of James' exhortation is not giving partiality to the rich over the poor. Gold rings showed a man was rich. In Roman society, the wealthy wore rings on their left hand in great profusion. Every finger was just full of rings. A sign of wealth. Rings were worn with great ostentation. If someone wanted to appear rich, there were even shops in Rome where you could go rent some rings. So if you're going to a party or a feast somewhere and you wanted to look rich, even though you weren't, just go rent you some rings and wear them on your left hand and see that people would treat you somewhat differently. The poor man may be disregarded because he has nothing to give. The rich man receives extra attention because he has resources and power. This can be problematic in a local church. James uses strong words to describe this hypocrisy. He said that when we give special honor to the wealthy and dishonor the poor, uh, then we become judges with evil thoughts. And the evil that shows up with this kind of partiality is that it can cause division and distinctions in the church fellowship that disturb unity and spiritual blessing. So when we meet together, let's drop any idea of somebody having a lot of money or not having any money, you know. Let's treat one another as equal in the sight of the Lord and love one another the same. Verse 5, he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? You know, there's a lot of ways to be rich. If you're going to be rich, you know, the best way possible is to be rich in faith. Be rich in the things of God. You know, I, I know I've shared this with you before, but my Papa Mac, my dad's father, uh, he had been a miner and a farmer mostly. Uh, he drew, you know, the last few years of his life, he drew a little Social Security check, and that was it. He lived in a, about a, probably a, an 18-foot camper uh, and I've been in it a few times. Uh, he ate from his own garden. He walked everywhere, never drove a car, uh, had very little education, but he was so rich in faith, and he passed that on to me. And he knew how to pray. That man could pray better than anybody I ever heard pray, you know. And he could teach the Bible really well for a man with no education to speak of. There were more people that came to hear my Papa Mac teach Sunday school than what came to the worship service that followed it, <laughs> you know, because he was rich in the Word of God. There are many ways to be rich. If you're going to be rich, the best way possible is to be rich in faith and rich in the things of God. So, in the early church, there were many 
Not many who were educated, not many rich, not many noble. The Apostle Paul pointed this out in 1 Corinthians 1.26. He said that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. There was a famous evangelist named D.L. Moody. And he got a lot of invitations of all places to speak at college and university campuses. But he didn't learn to read till he was full grown, and he butchered grammar <laughs> pretty badly. Those university students would heckle him and mock him when he preached. But at the end of his message, hundreds of them would come forward to receive Christ as their Savior. Why? Because he was rich in faith. It didn't matter that he butchered the English. Now, if you can, if you can avoid that, it's good, you know. <laughs> But most of us learned to read at a lot younger age than D.L. Moody did, you know. So anyways, what a great example of being rich in faith. Today we have heard how important it is to be a doer of what the law of liberty calls us to. James tells us a person who is not a forgetful hearer will do the work of love. It is a work of integrity. The person who claims to be religious, performing according to piety and traditions, but cannot bridle the tongue, that person's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion is to give attention to people in trouble, led by widows and orphans, those who cannot give back. Pure and undefiled religion is also marked by not conforming to the ways of the world and by not ignoring the poor who gather with us. It is marked by not showing partiality to those who are rich. This perfect law of liberty for us is to, contentious, uh, is to contentiously do as Christ Jesus commanded, love one another as I have loved you, to contend for that, to do the work of contending for love. Christ has loved us unconditionally and without partiality. God did not look at the world and say uh, to Jesus, and as he's getting ready to send Jesus to be with us, he didn't say to Jesus, okay, I want you to target the rich guys. Yeah, they can do a lot for us. He didn't do that. First people to hear the announcement that the Messiah was born were for who? Shepherds out on the hillside, the poor shepherds, lonely poor shepherds known mostly for being thieves and being banned from the temple. <laughs> he didn't give the message. To, he didn't say, okay, let's, let's, let's just find out who's got the deepest pockets out there, you know, or who's going to impress other people the most. He brought the message to the poor, and later Jesus would even say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In fact, when Jesus announced his mission and his ministry, what did he say? That the Holy Spirit was upon him to minister good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, set free those who are held captive, and bring justice for the oppressed. That is authentic religion. This is what it means to be a doer of the work of love so in the name of Christ, let's all get to work. Let's look intently at the law of liberty and live it out with one another and out in our world. It is the evidence of authentic faith in Christ Jesus. And those who do so will experience the blessed life, and the best life possible. Stand with me if you would. Father, I thank you for this word today that has come to us through James. I pray, Lord, that all of us who have heard that word today would not be forgetful hearers, but rather be doers. To hear your word and then to do the work that it calls us to do, the work of love. 
May your Holy Spirit enable and empower us to, be, to fulfill this call in our world. Also, Lord, want to pray for those who are struggling today with something, that your Holy Spirit would bring encouragement and your touch. I pray for those who feel like they're in the intensive care waiting room right now, just concerned about so many things. And I pray, Lord, that we would be sensitive to one another and the hurts we have, and to love one another and encourage one another, to let only words that are helpful come from our mouths, knowing that that's what gives glory to you, Lord, that that's what makes our religion pure and undefiled. In Jesus' name, amen.